Welcome back to another episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry. Folks, we've got a really interesting topic on today. It's something that we do every single day. We've been doing it since the moment we were born. But how much have you really thought about your breathing? Can we breathe incorrectly? And if that's the case, what do we need to do differently for us to get the full potential out of the most basic and instinctive thing we do? My guest this week is a leading international expert on breathing and says healthy breathing can have the power to change your lives for the better. Patrick McKeown is joining me today in studio to tell us how we can tap into that potential. Patrick, a very big welcome to the show. It's great to be here. Thanks very much, Carl. I'm excited. I love when people come in talking about this kind of stuff because we do. We take it for granted. Everyone listening in probably has never really thought about their breathing. They just breathe and chances are they're doing it incorrectly. This has been your life's work, hasn't it? Yeah, I suppose you'd never fall into this as a career. You, it, it's not a career that you would choose. So you always fall into this by accident. And I was always played with asthma as a child and teenager. And I had undiagnosed sleep apnea. I was tired. I had difficulty focusing and concentrating in school. I actually left school at 14, never to go back. I went to school in Declan's in Cabra. And uh, I went back one year later and studied for the leaving cert. But when you don't have the focus and concentration, you have to put in a lot of work. I got into TCD, I did the BESS course, and I struggled through university. I did get my degree, but it took a lot of work. I then was reading a newspaper article in the Irish Independent, and that's not just by coincidence. because And we're here, here we are. Building. Yes, here we are. And it spoke about the work of a Ukrainian doctor, and it talked about breathing in and out through your nose, and it also talked about breathing light. And I was doing not, neither of those things. Because of asthma, it's very common to have a stuffy nose, and if you have a stuffy nose, it's very common to have a sleep problem. Yep. So those two go hand in hand. I practiced his technique and I will say it genuinely changed my life. And, you know, I never thought I was going to teach breathing. I was then driving from Galway to Dublin and the idea came into my head and it was just a good feeling about it. And somebody asked me that weekend, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to start teaching breathing. So I contacted the Russian embassy here. They put me in touch with the Ukrainian doctor. I went over to Russia and I changed careers. Wow. So I've been teaching it since 2002. We had our 21st anniversary there on Paddy's Day. The first one that you mentioned, I think people may be familiar with nasal breathing. So, yes. you know, we we had James Nestor on the show before. It's quite, it is quite topical. The other one is interesting, which is breathing light. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, like it, it all goes hand in hand. Breathing is complex and it's multidimensional. Breathing isn't just about going and focusing on the biomechanics. That's only one component of it. I can give you this story. When I started initially getting into this, I was able to decongest my nose by holding my breath. And that's known since 1923. The more you breathe through your nose, the better it works. And also by softening and slowing down my breathing and taking about 30% less air into my body during the practice to the point that I felt a tolerable air hunger. The circulation of my hands improved. I always had cold hands, cold feet. And also I felt increased watery saliva in my mouth. Now, that's down to breathing light. So that's down to targeting breathing from a biochemical dimension. So we have about 50,000 miles of blood circulation and we can literally influence, dilate or constrict our blood vessels based on how hard and how fast we breathe. There's an idea out there in the Western world that the more air we breathe, the better. It's like it's a deep breath, isn't it? That's kind of the, the Western. The instruction is correct, yeah. but the interpretation of it is incorrect. Okay. Because if we take, if I said to somebody, I would like you now to start breathing hard and fast, that's going to cause too much carbon dioxide to be removed from the blood through the lungs. And carbon dioxide, it's not just a waste gas. If you breathe hard and fast, blood flow reduces. And many people will experience dizziness. They feel lightheaded. And also when you breathe hard and fast, it's a stressor. Now, there's a time to stress the body using breathing exercises. But for many people, it's not about the stressor. We need recovery. Mm -hmm. We need to understand how do we bring the autonomic nervous system back into balance? We do that with nose breathing is always the foundation. Light breathing, slow breathing, low breathing. And then in terms of bringing in for me, whenever I'm working with somebody with anxiety or panic disorder, I always want to get their physiology as best as I can in balance first and then bring in awareness. I often feel that it's very frustrating for many, many individuals with dysfunctional breathing. And I was one of those individuals. You know, there was a reason that I left school at 14. My attention, I was stuck in my head all the time. And having just awareness of the breath wasn't enough because I was in that increased stress response all the time. 
So this is where, you know, Carl, I suppose if somebody was to ask, what's the best tool or what's the what's the best thing that it has gave me over the last 20 odd years? It's the ability to regulate my states. I can come in here. I can do an interview view with you. I'm able to regulate my states before the interview. You know, I go out and I work with different individuals. Some of them are world class. And again, you know, making public presentations to large groups of people. I use the breadth to regulate my state. And it's not about taking the deep breadth that people talk about. And for listening, in, for people listening in, you know, regulating your state, you're talking about stress, anxiety, worry, concern, all the things that would elevate our heart rate, which in turn elevates our breathing rate. Yes, but also if we breathe hard and fast, and this has been known, like none of this stuff is new. And there was a paper, for example, written back in 1988, which I cited in previous work. And the paper taught, it was written by Somyon and Balestrino. They said, the brain by regulating breathing regulates its own excitability. So we have brain cells, we have 81 billion brain cells, and each brain cell is communicating with about 15,000 other brain cells. If we breathe hard and fast, brain cells become excited. Mm -hmm. And this in turn is going to increase anxiety. And there's so many different aspects to this that we can change our breathing patterns to tell the brain that the body is safe. Like, for example, any of us know if we get into a stressful state, our breathing automatically gets faster. We sigh more. We're feeling air hunger. We're breathing up our chest. And the body in that instance is telling the brain that the body is under threat. And all the brain wants to do is get you out of the situation. Now, some people know this. You know, Dr. Rang and Chatterjee, he was talking to a brain surgeon and we've, just, we've had both on the show, both Rangan and the brain surgeon. The brain wow. surgeon uh, is from Dr. The, Rahul. Yes, we had him. Yeah, 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 we did. In his interview, and I was listening because I, I know Rangan because I was on his podcast. Mm -hmm. And in the when the brain surgeon, Dr. Rahul, was being interviewed, Dr. Rahul said, he says, in quote, he says, when I get into a tricky situation, he said, the first thing I do is prevent myself from hyperventilating. And I was just thinking to myself, of course he knows this because he understands physiology, mm -hmm. but why doesn't a child in school know it? Why didn't I know it going through university? You know, I went to one of the exams going into the exam hall in TCD. I was stressed going in because I always had poor sleep. I was breathing faster, upper chest breathing. Automatically, mouth breathers are in an increased stress response. And I took a walk for about two minutes before going into the exam hall. And I took these full big breaths. And I remember walking in there and I knew I wasn't in the right place. I was disoriented. I was feeling lightheaded. And it was the absolute worst thing that I could do to help myself through that exam. Now, you know, all of this stuff, like I remember reading Dr. Morris Cottle. He founded the oh, yeah. American Rhinological Society back in 1954. And he said the human nose performs 30 functions in the human body. And I could never find these functions. And now, of course, we're putting the list together. The human knows by breathing through it increases memory, it increases attention, so re retention of information. And how many children, between 25 to 50 percent of studied children are persistently mouth breathing. The brain develops in children during slow wave sleep. But if a child is mouth breathing or snoring or stopping breathing during sleep, and they only have to be stopping breathing for two breaths at a time, that will take them out of the slow wave sleep, out of the deep sleep, and it impacts brain development. So a study of 11,000 children by Karen Bonnock at Stratford-upon-Avon in the UK over about, about four years, a longitudinal study. Children with sleep disorders, which include snoring and sleep apnea, if untreated at age five, they have a 40% increased risk of special education needs by age eight. This is all buried in PubMed. The general population don't get to hear of it. So bring us from, you know, that situation you're going into the exam hall, yes. you're doing the deep breaths, like a lot of people would do, because that's kind of the, the societal of what you should do. So flip that and tell us what should you do then? So you're going into, the, so anyone listening in, they're going into a big exam or a job interview and they might go for that two minute walk and they'll do the big deep breaths and try and kind of relax themselves. What should they be doing instead? What's, what's, the, what's the alternative? Sit down for about 15 minutes or so before the exam is about to start. Find a quiet corner. Close your eyes. You don't necessarily have to. You don't have to be in this meditation state or anything like that. You don't need any of that stuff. You just need to tap into your breath and remember to do the opposite to what Dr. Rahul said. He said, don't hyperventilate. If you hyperventilate, which is faster breathing, upper chest breathing, harder breathing, you're putting the body and mind into a fight or flight response. We need to do the opposite. Breathe in through our nose, in and out. 
really soften and slow down the speed of the breath coming into the nose and have a very, very slow and relaxed and gentle exhalation. It's the speed of the exhalation that tells the brain whether we are stressed, whether there's a threat, or whether everything is safe. And all the brain wants to do is to protect us. So the brain is constantly monitoring our breathing. There are structures in the brain that were identified in 2017, and these structures in the brain are spying on our breathing. Now, we've also got communication, of course, from the body up to the brain, and that's via the vagus nerve, which is this nerve that's wandering throughout the body, innervating most of the major organs, if not all of them, and 80 to 90% of the communication of the vagus nerve is from the body up to the brain. Now, when we have that really slow and relaxed and gentle exhalation, and nobody will even know that we are doing it. So you could be a, a child 12 years of age, or you could be a student, say, of 18, going in to do the, the leaving cert, for example. You're feeling a little bit stressed. Don't start practicing this on the morning of the exam. Become in tune with your breathing in the weeks and the months leading up to the exam. And know how to self-regulate. It's all in the speed of the exhalation. If you breathe out fast, it's a stressor. If you have a really slow and relaxed exhalation, so you're taking, say, a normal breath in, silent through the nose, and then a really slow and relaxed exhalation over maybe five, six, seven, eight seconds, and continuously doing that in 30 seconds, you will start changing your physiology. And this can be objectively measured via heart rate variability, which is a measure of vagal tone. But that is a tremendous exercise that we can all use. And I will often say, you know, how many times that something has been happening on the outside. So there could be, say, for example, a bully in a situation or there's some situation happening externally. Bring your attention internally at that point. Nobody even knows that you're doing it. Take that soft breath in through your nose and that really relaxed and slow, gentle breath out. And you are not going to surrender all of your attention to the mood of the individual that's at hand. We all need skills like this, and our breath is something that we tap into. Now, oftentimes, the subtlety of breathing gets overlooked because in Western society, we want these extroverted techniques. We want to be hyperventilating. We want to be doing long breath holes. Don't start with them. They are major, major stressors. Blood oxygen saturation can drop below 50%. I've seen people passing out. I myself have put people into panic attacks and high anxiety from doing different breathing techniques. And this is what 20 years of experience teaches you. It teaches you that we have to dip our toes into the water gently, but start off with nose breathing. We have nothing to lose. We have everything to gain. And it's nose breathing during rest and also during light to moderate physical exercise. It often comes as a surprise if I was to go to a local gym. And I know, of course, I know you're in this space yeah. as well. And if I was to open the door and look in and just ask the question, how many people in this gym are actually doing their physical exercise with their mouth closed? It will be probably zero. Now, why are they having their mouth open during physical exercise? What does the mouth do? It does nothing. It's a hole. So the mouth is simply an orifice that air can go straight down your throat into your lungs, but your mouth does nothing for breathing. So it's an emergency. And that's the way it was throughout our evolution. Because we as human beings, there's so many functions of the nose that adapted throughout our evolution, such as improved visual spatial awareness. So say, for example, we are a hunter. We have our eyes on the target, but at the same time, we're scanning for predators. Those same skills we could use on a football field. We also select our partners via the communication from the olfactory nerve from the nose to the brain. So the nose is in direct communication with the brain. When you breathe through your nose, oxygen uptake in the blood increases by 10%. When you breathe through your nose during physical exercise, carbon dioxide cannot leave the body so quickly because your nose has got a resistance to your breathing to slow down your breath. And as carbon dioxide increases in the blood, the blood vessels dilate. And there's what's called a right shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve. This is just a normal physiological law that hemoglobin, which is the main carrier of oxygen in the blood, releases oxygen more readily. So the individual who is doing their physical exercise with their mouth closed, they have higher oxygen uptake in the blood, they have higher oxygen delivery to the tissues, they have a better recovery, they're protecting their airways. So if we think of this country here, you know, we have one of the highest incidences of asthma in the world. That was my space originally that brought me into breathing. Nobody ever said to me, Patrick, 
breathe through your nose. Card, it just does not make sense. I cannot understand it. When I went to my doctors over years and I was hospitalized in James Connolly Hospital as well. I think it's a different name now in Blanchardstown. Yeah, yeah. And I was there for a two week stint. I went on Doris skiing, the cold, dry air coming into my lungs, put me into hospital there. And I had many episodes of nebulizers over the years. No doctor ever said to me, Patrick, you need your nose to protect your lungs. In actual fact, your nose is the only organ that protects your lungs. And back in 1991, there was a gas called nitric oxide that was identified in the exhale breath of the human. Nitric oxide is antiviral. Nitric oxide helps to open up the airways. It's a bronchodilator. It helps to redistribute the blood throughout the lungs. And nitric oxide is here to protect our lungs. During COVID, there was no mention in Ireland of breathing through the nose. Why? Why are we going around with the mouth open when the mouth is not the place to use? OK, an odd mouth breath here and there, fine. But we need to start having a conversation here. Sleep. 50% of the adult population are waking up with a dry mouth in the morning. It is well known in the literature. Dry mouth is synonymous with increased snoring and sleep apnea. Dental health. I was a mouth breather. I have a mouthful of poor teeth. Gum disease, dental cavities, bad breath, crooked teeth. Because when we have the mouth closed with the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, it's the pressures exerted by the tongue resting in the roof of the mouth, which helps to shape the maxilla. So our top jaw should be nice and wide and U-shaped, and then there's plenty of room for the teeth. But more importantly, when the top jaw is nice and wide and U-shaped, there's plenty of room for the tongue. And the tongue then is coming out of the airway. I have a high narrow palate. I had overcrowding of teeth. And how many youngsters now today that if you go into a school, primary school, 11 and 12 years of age, probably about three quarters of those children are going to require orthodontic treatment. Now, you know, orthodontic treatment, when we see that a child has got overcrowding of teeth, it's not primarily genetics. Our ancestors, if you go down to the Natural History Museum here, and if you look at skulls of our ancestors, they didn't have crooked teeth. Crooked teeth are a bad sign because it's telling us that the mouth is too small. And if the mouth is too small, where is the tongue going to go? It's going to impact our airway. Now, if we have poor sleep, those children with poor sleep, we're talking about brain development. We're talking about those kids not reaching their full potential. And it's not just those children. Men and women, we are so susceptible to sleep disorders and they are aggravated by virtue of mouth breathing and the formation of our airway. You're making a very good sell. <clears throat> You're making a very good sell to say the least. Take some water for a second if you want to. You've been chatting away. We are having a fascinating chat about all things breathing. So you sold it, I think, to everyone listening in. I don't hopefully. want to sell it. Well, I it, want. It's you know, it's a very, <laughs> in terms of that simple swap from the the fast breathing that we and the deep breath to calm nasal breathing. So for people yes. to practice nasal breathing more or start to practice it, what tips have you got to help them? to do that or what should they start with or how do they start? Because for some people it's uncomfortable, for some people it might be nervous, you know, what's the best way to start? For children, we have launched an app recently. Um, it's Oxygen Advantage app. And I will disclose, I put $150,000 into the app. The app is free. I never intend to have a subscription on the app. We are very fortunate as a business in the West Coast of Ireland. I'm originally from the East here. We have a, a very nice business. We have 12 staff and we are doing, we're comfortable. So the app was not monetary. The app is about driving awareness. All of the exercises are there. There are exercises for children which are completely free. All of them are available on YouTube. Compliments of my daughter, who's 12 years of age, who was the model during it. Exercise for sports performance, for panic disorder, for anxiety. So basically, I got my 21 years spent 12 months putting, putting them into a spreadsheet and developing daily plans for people based on their health, their BOLT score, which we use for adults as a means of determining functional breathing patterns, which has since been proven um, in 2019. So that's available. So what I would say to people is just start paying attention to your breathing and ask yourself the question, is there times during rest that you feel that you're not getting enough air? Is there times that you feel that your breathing is effortful? Our breathing should never be effortful. Start breathing in and out through the nose. If your nose gets stuffy, provided that you're not pregnant or you have any serious medical conditions or panic dis disorder, do the nose and blocking exercise, which is simply like this. 
Take a normal breath in and out through your nose. Pinch your nose and hold your nose. Gently nod your head up and down as you hold your breath. And hold your breath until an air hunger that's comfortable for you. As you hold your breath, it's activating a stress response. It's also increasing carbon dioxide in the blood, and this will have to open up the nose, and this is known since 1923. So again, none of the information is new. Even if you feel a little bit uncomfortable breathing through your nose, continue to breathe through your nose. Always remember that your mouth is not for breathing. Okay, you might say, well, when I'm running in a gym and I'm really feeling a strong air hunger, should I have, should I be excruciating breathing in the net through my nose? Of course not. So, but I would say for recreational athletes, the human nose is at least 30 functions. So I have a list at the moment. I couldn't find Dr. Morris Cottle's list. Couldn't find it anywhere. So I said, only about a month ago, let's start putting this list together for ourselves. Now, it's all we had the information anyway. It was just a matter of collating it. <clears throat> Remember, when you do your physical exercise, the benefits of it's protecting the airways. You've got improved blood circulation, improved oxygen delivery, but also the communication from your nose to the brain. But what's more, when you breathe through your nose during physical exercise, it adds an extra load onto the diaphragm. It slows down your breathing. It reduces the chemosensitivity to carbon dioxide. So your breathing then outside of physical exercise is better. 90% of athletes in a recent study, which I can send you on, published in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, had dysfunctional breathing. 90%. I wouldn't have believed the figure myself. I knew that 75% of anxiety and panic disorder people have dysfunctional breathing. And let's just, just look at that person who's listening to us here. They typically will have a little bit faster of a respiratory rate. It's not that they are having a panic attack. Their breathing rate is just that little bit faster. They are breathing a little bit harder. They have irregular breathing. They feel they're not getting enough air. And that physiology is feeding into their panic. Now, they can do cognitive behavioral therapy. They can do all of the counseling. They will find meditation a little bit frustrating because their mind is going to be a little bit more agitated because their physiology is in that stress response. This is the conversation that we need to have. We need to have as, a, as human beings, we have these tools. And I know that breathing has been around for 30 and 40 and 50 years in the Western world, but the essence of it has been overlooked. It's not about taking the full big breaths. It's not about just how you breathe on the mat. It's about how you breathe all the time. It's about connecting with your breath. Like I used to go to school, Cabra first, but then Suffolk Street, mm -hmm. Sing Street. And I remember walking down Grafton Street or walking up along the Keys. I wouldn't see any of it because my attention was constantly in, stuck in my head, thinking. And we are trained as individuals. We are trained how to think. We are trained how to analyze, to break information into tiny pieces. We are trained how to think. We are not trained how to stop thinking. We as human beings need to be able to have some degree of control over our mind. And especially the time is right now when we consider smartphones and the damage that they are doing for teenagers. I think the key thing from today's chat people will take away is that it's that control piece. So it's taking control of your breathing and that brings you to a better, more mindful state. It's controlling from the perceived fast to the normal slow and steady. And I think people listening in, but that simple swap will bring lots more people into trying nasal breathing and trying the benefits of it. If people want to find you, where can they find you online and stuff? Tell me, give us all, all your details. Sure. Our website for health is called butekoclinic.com. That's B-U-T-E-Y-K-O clinic. And that's named after the Ukrainian doctor. And then I have a website for sports performance and mental performance. And that's called oxygenadvantage.com. And of course, we are on social media too. So when I give out about social media, yes, we yeah. are there, but use it selectively. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming in today. We really appreciate it. Great content, great tips. I think that switch from deep breath to shallow We'll really get lots of people into breathing properly, which is fantastic. So thank you so much for coming in. Folks, that is it for the episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry. You know where we are, at Carl Henry PT on Instagram, realhealthindependent.ie. And we'll see you next week for more Real Health. Salon. So